Coming up next, we're going to go behind the top 10 songs of this very same week from the year 1983. 39 years ago to be exact. Now this top 10 has a very unique event. Michael Jackson was at number one the week previous to this, and he would have a chance to replace himself at number one. Will he do it? Or will Styx or Prince or Dexy's Midnight Runners or even the police stop him? Find out next on our latest edition of the Hit Song Redux. Hey, music junkies, professor of rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you've ever called up Dial MTV back in the day to vote for your favorite artists, this is the channel just for you. Make sure to subscribe below right now to be a part of our Music History Daily, straight from the artists, the stories, and uh, you can also become an honorary producer on our Patreon by clicking on the link in the description that helps us keep this a daily channel. You can also see our new merch that helps us as well. Uh, including our brand new entries into the Vintage Years collection. So it's time for another edition of our show, my favorite, the Hit Song Redux. This is where we travel back to a week in the golden era of the rock and roll era, and we re-rank the top 10 songs of that specific week based on how much the world has listened to them since their peak position on the Billboard Hot 100. Uh, this has artist commentary, the actual artists, it has your stories, your dedications. Now to clarify, again, this isn't my top 10. It's the actual top 10 from this exact week, uh, 39 weeks ago. And then as we count them down, we run them through a recalibration system after, and that tells us what the real top 10 is based on all time streams and views since then. This program is really tip of the hat to the great Casey Case and my hero, the American Top 40 Countdown, which we all grew up with. And again, we travel back to this exact week in the year 1983. So back then, if you wanted to catch a movie at the local cinema, you'd decide between Flashdance with Jennifer Bills, The Outsiders with the who's who of now famous Brat Packers, including Tom Cruise and Ralph Macchio. Essie Hinton's classic novel comes to the screen, capturing all the intensity. Or uh, The Black Stallion Returns. The Black Stallion Returns. Whatever happened to the Black Stallion movies? They were so big back in the day. I remember watching them uh, over and over again. I'm sure Hollywood <laughs> will find a way to remake them. Now on TV, if you had cable, you could catch Jim Henson's Fraggle Rock. It was one of my all-time favorites as a kid. Never missed an episode. <laughs> Could also ride along with B.A. Baracus and the A-Team. Even Michael Knight and Kit the Car on Knight Rider. So that was your choice. What a great era for TV. So let's get into it. So coming in at number 10, it's a song that is bona fide 80s gold from the mad scientist of New Wave himself. She blinded me with science by one Thomas Dolby. Lots of great factoids on this song. First of all, this song is about a scientist who falls in love with his lab assistant. Dolby once said in an interview, it's probably about the most frivolous song that I've ever written. When I play it now, I still get a big kick out of it. I mean, I'm perfectly proud of the song and it's got a great groove and it's loaded with hooks. And when I play it, it's iconic, I think for many people, especially people who were around the first time. I have no regrets over that because I think that provided a sort of starting point for people to get into the more serious, more personal aspects of my music. Uh, I would say it's hook laden. I mean, what a great song. Actually, legendary producer Mutt Lang sang backup vocals on this hit. He had originally met Thomas Dolby when Dolby was busking on the streets of Paris, and uh, Dolby sent in a tape of his songs to the publisher that Mutt Lang worked with, and Mutt heard the tape and invited uh, Dolby to work on the 400 4 album. You might remember that Dolby played the iconic synth part on the number two hit, Waiting for a Girl Like You. She Blinded Me With Science peaked at number five on the charts, and it's been covered by William Shatner, amongst others. Blinding Me With Science? Science? 
In at the number nine spot, it's the legendary musical Chameleon, along with famed producer Nile Rodgers, with a new look and a new feel for the 80s. It's David Bowie with Let's Dance. Let's dance to the song now, Let's Dance ended up being one of Bowie's fastest-selling singles. Uh, it entered the UK singles chart at number five on its first week of release, and it stayed at number one for three weeks after that. Uh, and then it went to uh, the top of the Billboard Hot 100, becoming Bowie's first and only single to top the charts in both the US and the UK. It was also his second and last single to reach number one in the US. The other, of course, was Fame in 1975. Now, many said that Bowie had sold out with Let's Dance, but they were wrong. This was David Bowie transforming once again, proving that the MTV age could only be improved by his presence and creativity. Bowie got with Chic founder Now Rogers looking to create dance music, and it worked in a big way as Bowie had two other massive hits from the album. There's Modern Love and China Girl, both great songs. We're definitely going to cover this song in more detail very soon. Coming in at the number eight position, it's a song that has just reawakened the world to its power as the backbone of the new Stranger Things campaign with the voice and the virtuoso. It's journey with separate ways worlds apart. Jonathan Cain and Steve Perry penned this song while they were on tour during a time when guitarist and founder Neil Sean and uh, then bassist Ross Valerie were going through painful divorces due to the stresses and let's just say the seductions of life on the road. Steve Perry and Jonathan Cain took those things and turned them into a top 10 smash, one of the great rock songs of all time. In fact, they wrote it in a hotel room on a little Casio, and it was in the show by the next evening. Here's what Neil Sean had to say about the song. You know what? I wish I had, I wish I could tell you a great story like, I brought this in and it was all me, <laughs> right. but really, it, I had nothing to do with it. Uh, you know, John and Steve were backstage, and they, were, they worked on it for, I don't know, two, three days, you know, uh, while we were hanging out backstage, you know, waiting to play a show. But what about the solo? Uh, the solo, well, I improvised. That's but John, John solo. actually gave me the melody. You know, the opening melody, which is like the melody of the song. He gave me that melody because I didn't know what to do with it. Again, he was like, well, just play something like this. And he played like a little melody and I went, oh, I get yeah. it. As we slide into the number seven position, I do want to recognize our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, the rock star choice for glasses, if I can say so myself. If you want to feel like a rock star, I do when I wear them. Zenny is the only way to go. Go to zenny.com and you choose your color, your shape, and your style, and the rest is history. They send them right to you. You'll look marvelous, as they said back in the day, and uh, check it out today. So the number seven position is filled with the greatest duo of all time, in my opinion, anytime with one of the smoothest duets of the decade it's daryl hall and john oates with a one-on-one -on -one. now daryl hall has said that this is one of his favorite hall and oates songs he said that in entertainment weekly back in the day he explained that he was on the road for so many years living a very transient life he said, exactly, and I'll quote it, you're everywhere and you're nowhere. In your domestic life, your concept of home becomes very special to an artist. This song sort of describes that. Here's what John Oates had to say about this song in a recent interview that we did. We had a great 80s band that kept getting better and, the, and we would tour and the band kept getting tighter. And we'd go right from the tour straight into the studio once we had some songs. And, you know, so the band was well-oiled, um, great players, 
great engineers, you know, Bob Clearmountain, Neil Kernan, uh, great studios, you know, it was just all working, man. It was all, it was all working. One on one, it's just, uh, it's really one of my favorite Hall & Oates songs ever. Uh, you can definitely feel the longing in Daryl Hall's voice. I remember the, I put this on a lot of mixtapes, uh, the first ones that I made as a kid. Now, One on One has had 22 million streams since its release. Just you and me. You and me. You. All right, moving along to the number six position on the count, and you have one of the great one-hit wonders of the decade, a true bottle lightning classic from a band that uh, for a split second, when I first heard it, I thought it was The Cure. It's Der Commissar by After the Fire. And when I was a little kid, my aunt listened to The Cure, and that's how I knew them before Der Commissar. This song is so quintessentially 80s, it actually hurts. Now, the original version of this 80s classic was recorded in German by the Austrian singer Falco of the number one hit Rock Me Amadeus fame. Falco's version of Der Commissar was a popular dance floor track in Europe. Uh, but because of the language barrier, Falco encouraged After the Fire to record it in English as to uh, blaze a trail in the United States. Don't turn around. Oh, oh. Now, After the Fire was a British group whose most well-known member was former Yes synth man Peter Banks. Uh, like I said, this would prove to be their only hit as the follow-up single to this, uh, Dancing in the Shadows. That would end up stalling it, uh, I believe it was number 85. Dancing in the shadows. Dancing in the sh Although the song has had a massive afterlife with uses in movie and TV, including a memorable scene in The Wedding Singer. All right, halfway through the countdown at number five. It's a song that a week before this in 83 had reigned at the top of the charts for its seventh straight week. And it actually looked like it would never be dethroned as it was the biggest hit from that phenomenon called Thriller. It's Michael Jackson with Billie Jean. If it would have remained at the number one position, it would have done something uh, not done since The Beatles. More on that later. But Thriller, of course, the most dominant album of all time. It's still the biggest selling album of all time worldwide. And uh, you know what? I'll argue it's still the biggest selling album in U.S. history, even if the RIAA claims it's the Eagles' greatest hits. I'll leave that for uh, another day, another video. And I have no bias because I love Eagles. But uh, having said that, Here's what a few pros who worked on Thriller told me about the album. Billie Jean, arguably one of the most recognizable pop yeah, songs ever. Yeah. Just from the beginning. The That's John Robinson. And then... But I do remember this. Quincy invited me and Rod to this uh, meeting at, at uh, Michael's where we had our own private world premieres of Billie Jean Beat It and Want to Be Starting Something. I'll never forget that. The call to get, you know, he called me on the phone like 8 o'clock in the morning and I didn't believe it was him. I thought it was one of my friends joking around saying it was Michael Jackson. I kept hanging up and then Quincy Jones' office called and said, no, that was really Michael. You should call him back. He wanted me to come work with them on some of the stuff before we went in the studio. Everybody, and I mean everybody, has a Michael Jackson thriller story. You weren't an 80s kid if you don't. Mine was that I had the jacket, I had the glove, I had the doll. I still have it. Along with Billy Joel's An Innocent Man, it was one of the first albums I bought with my own money, even though my parents had it on vinyl and cassette. This was, uh, of course, popular with our viewers who shared stories from the record. A viewer, Shane Stewart, said, as an 80s kid, I enjoyed picking up unspooled tapes from the side of the road. Buying every album I liked was just too expensive for me. Plus, repairing broken tapes was a big hobby of mine. Michael Jackson's Thriller was so popular that I managed to pluck three copies of it from the side of the road. 
When combined, I have the complete album that was undamaged. Didn't have to buy that one. I could just play a song or songs from part of each one for an unwrinkled sound. Now that's cool. I'm sure that we all could have used Shane's expertise back in the 80s when our boombox was eating our tapes. Another viewer, Travis Tate, said, Michael Jackson's Thriller album came out when I was little. My brother got a copy shortly after it came out. What I didn't know was that my childhood friend was not allowed to listen to it because it scared the crud out of him. <laughs> so I put the song on. I forced him to listen to it in the closet with the door closed. He was fine, or so I thought. Found out later that night as his mother called over yelling at my mom about us listening to Thriller because now my friend couldn't get to sleep because he was terrified. <laughs> oh boy, I, uh, I have a few memories just like that. I remember uh, in grade school, a teacher tried to take away the Thriller album from anybody who had it, you know, listening on our Walkmans because she said it was Satan's greatest tool to recruit kids into his club. <laughs> you really can't tell a story from the 80s without a little satanic panic. Heading into the number four spot, it's the biggest hit from a band that worked long and hard to get where they wanted to be, their biggest hit. The song was famously parodied by Weird Al as well. It's the Greg Keane Band with Jeopardy. This was Greg Keane Band's biggest hit, and it was a slow build. They released nine albums between 1978 and 1986. They didn't have a hit until the breakup song, They Don't Write Them, which was on album number six, I believe. They don't write like that anymore. Jeopardy was on album eight. In an interview that was done in 1984, Greg Keane said that when writing songs that he tries to stick to simple themes and tends to write about relationships and his girlfriend. A Jeopardy was a departure for the band, really had more of a, a pop sound, and it was a bit off the wall, um, coming out of left field for them. It was atypical of uh, the rock sound that the band had established previous to this. When Weird Al covered it, uh, as I lost on Jeopardy, really seemed to push it even further into the mainstream. In fact, most of our viewers' memories of this song come by the way of Weird Al. Screen name Jim Bubba FPV said, Oh my goodness, my first exposure to the song Jeopardy was Weird Al's version. I lost on Jeopardy. When it first came out, the original Jeopardy was no longer on the air, and the Alex Trebek version hadn't even started yet, so I had to ask my mom what it was all about. And the first time I heard Greg Keane's version on the radio, I thought maybe my tuner was off, because it just didn't sound right. But then I realized in a rare moment of clarity <laughs> that this was the original version that Weird Al was in fact parodying. We had another viewer, I uh, hope I say your name right, it's Hatik Aromezis, who said, whenever I think of or hear Greg King's Jeopardy, all I can think of or hear is Weird Al's parody, I lost on Jeopardy. I knew I was in trouble now. Weird Al, of course, the parody king. I do remember, though, watching Greg's video when I was a kid. It freaked me out for some reason. And then after writing this comment, he said that he tracked down the video he watched it again with a fresh set of eyes, and it freaked him out again. <laughs> okay, we're getting ever so closer to the number one spot. Coming in at number three, we have a band that had gone from the clubs to the arenas by the time this song came out. And this song really seemed to split the band with its uh, futuristic theme, also split the fans. It sticks with Mr. Roboto. What is likely their most uh, well-known song across all generations? Like I said, this is a song that fractured the band, and by the next year, 1984, Sticks uh, as a unit was essentially done until the 90s. I think it was the experience of creating a Kilroy was here that really did them in more than anything. 
And it's so sad that the band has been fractured because how cool would it be to see Dennis DeYoung and Tommy Shaw together? Here's what Dennis DeYoung actually said about the song. We all do it together. We love it. Everybody in the band, we're all together. Tommy brings the vocoder in. And we're having a ball doing it because we're going to do something we've never done before. This is different. I'm Kilroy! 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 Why did he do that? How does that make any sense? So people kept up and up, and I said, no, that's record company. That's pretty catchy. It's either that or don't let it end. I contend if we'd have released Don't Let It In first, there would have been almost no controversy. All right, coming in at number two. It's an artist who might have done the impossible had a few things gone a little differently. He was just one week shy of having the number one and number two songs in the world and would have also replaced himself at number one. It's Michael Jackson with another number one from Thriller, Beat It. At that point, only the Beatles and Elvis Presley had accomplished such a feat, and the Beatles actually did it twice. Well, MJ came close, he was a week off. Had he released Beat It, you know, one or two weeks earlier, or maybe Billy Jean one week later, may have happened, but as a consolation prize, Thriller spent a modern record 37 weeks at number one on the album charts. Here's what Toto said about working on Beat It. That was a cut and paste job, man. I mean, Eddie Van Halen cut the two inch tape. Couldn't, wouldn't sync up. So <laughs> Jeff and I had to put that back together again at Sunset Sound, which we did. And uh, the rest is rather... That's him playing all the guitars, all the bass, everything but the solo. Yeah, Eddie, I played everything but the solo. Paul Jackson says he played on it, but I don't hear it. David Williams said he played on it. I, mean, yeah. I just hear me on it. Paul's a great player. Paul's on the record. All right, here's another great story from one of our viewers about Michael Jackson and the thriller phenomenon. I tell you, this is one of the funniest I've heard on here. Screen name RBS, one of my favorites. Uh, he said, spring 1983, thriller is the big thing. And everyone is clamoring for a piece of the Michael. I'm getting ready to graduate from high school. And this girl in my school, Angie, finds out that Michael was going to have lunch at Tavern on the Green in New York City. She wanted to ditch class and get his autograph. I, like others, was infatuated, briefly, with the King of Pop. And I agreed to go with her. I was the only boy with five girls. So we go to a side entrance at the cafeteria in our school, and we escape, and we fly to the tavern. Mass pandemonium. There were all these people. I proceed to wait near a side entrance with Angie. We had to stake out certain areas to see where he would come out. And Michael, all smiles, comes out in a black bolero jacket, black jeans, and get this, no glasses. Angie freaked out and started dancing for him, and MJ pulled out a red marker and started signing away. But MJ signed my copy of Thriller because MJ's security was so busy keeping Angie away from MJ, she couldn't get her LP out. Then she accused me of snatching her copy and getting it signed. Oh, she was so mad. Man. Had that autograph for two decades until I decided to sell it on eBay in 2003. I went to swipe the dust off the cover with a wet wipe, and I swiped off Michael's signature. I screamed for dear life, ah, since it was worthless now. I ended up donating it to an inner city boys and girls club where they had it framed and put it in the school gym. I have no idea if it's still there, and it was the only signature I had from Mike. Oh, well, he was a thriller regardless. I love that story. I mean, it just killed me. Wiping off MJ's signature? Oh, man. Okay, here we are, the number one position for this very same week in 1983. It's a song that pulled off a major upset of stopping Michael Jackson from replacing himself at number one. It's a band from the other side of the ocean with a, a very naughty song indeed. Dexy's Midnight Runners with Come On Eileen. Come on, Eileen. Oh, I swear, baby,
The group took their name from the amphetamine dexedrine, a stimulant favored by northern soul dancers. Their name notwithstanding, the band gained an almost puritanical reputation for their aversion to drink and drugs. Now, Come On Eileen is based on a true story, and it describes the thin line, the very thin line between love and lust. Let's take up Eileen was actually a girl that singer Kevin Rowland grew up with. Uh, they became romantic when both were 13, and then it moved to a more intimate affair a few years later, uh, as Rowland has claimed. Now, Rowland was raised a Catholic. He served as an altar boy, and uh, sex was taboo, very, considered very dirty. And, of course, he would say that in the song. So, essentially, when Rowland wrote this number one hit, uh, he was fantasizing about making Whoopi through the eyes of his adolescent self while fighting societal norms of the time. Not unlike the Beach Boys' take on the same thing when they did Wouldn't It Be Nice. It be nice be older, Which I tried to explain that to a very mean teacher at my middle school who was a Beach Boys fan because of their innocence and uh, she in turn loathed Dexie's Midnight Runners in this song. She called it uh, very repulsive. I was, of course, sent to the principal's office for debating with her. We'll have a deeper dive on this song in the future. It's just a classic. This is another song that, of course, our viewers loved. Viewer Phil Owens said, When Come On Eileen was a hit, they'd play it every night at our local clubs. Everyone liked it, and everyone danced to it. Which was fine until you got to the break where the music stops, and then starts again at a slower tempo, and then it builds back up. Come on, I need to do right. No one, and I mean no one that knew how to handle it. It looked like everyone had lost control of their limbs. 50 or so people dancing to 50 different rhythms, you know, all looking at their partners to see what they were doing. And when the break was over, everyone would just suddenly clicked back into step again. Always makes me smile when I think of that. I love that. We also had a viewer, Thomas Bimbattle. I hope I said your name right. He said, I remember in the early 90s being in a bar on the Upper East Side of Manhattan 2nd Avenue around uh, 98th Street. And when Come On Eileen had a spin on the jukebox, the whole place sang along very loudly. Every word, the whole song. It was remarkable. I never forgot that moment. <laughs> Again, a lot of great comments from our viewers. Well, there you have it. The top 10 songs of this very same week from good old 1983. <laughs> they just don't make them like they used to. I mean, seriously, every one of these songs still resonates right now. So uh, there were actually three other songs that were in the top 100 charts for that week that were close to their peak positions. And they didn't even make the top 10 after that. I didn't think they made the top 20. And these songs are huge today, and I'd like to include them in our recalibration. What they are is Love My Way by the Psychedelic Furs. My way, it's a new, new Year's Day by U2. Day. And I Melt With You by Modern English. All three of these are great songs. So let's uh, reassess these 13 songs Put them through our recalculation system, including all-time streams, radio plays, and views. Drum roll, please. Here's your new top 10 based on all-time streams. At number 10, it's the Greg Keane Band with Jeopardy, 41 million. At number 9, it's a new entry, U2 with New Year's Day with 51 million. At number eight, it's Mr. Roboto by Styx with 91 million. At number seven, it's Modern English with I Melt With You with 142 million. At number six, another new one, Love My Way by The Psychedelic Furs with 151 million. At number five is David Bowie, Let's Dance, with 275 million streams. Okay, at number four, Journey with Separate Ways, Worlds Apart, with 286 million. Someday, 
And no doubt that number is going to go up with the use on the new Stranger Things season as uh, new listeners discover it. And number three, it's Dexy's Midnight Runners with Come On Eileen, 614 million streams and views. And that means that Michael Jackson pulled off in 2022 what he couldn't do in 83 with the top two songs of this redux. And number two, he has Beat It with 1.8 billion. And at number one is Billie Jean with an amazing 2.5 2.5 billion streams. That's a record for the 80s as the most streamed number one and number two hit of the decade in the same week. So there it is, the new top 10 from this very same week and good old 1983, based on all time streams and views, of course. <sighs> oh, how I wish that I could turn on the radio and hear a top 10 or even a top 40 countdown with with just five songs of this caliber today. Look at it this way. We can still listen to reruns of Casey Kasem and uh, relive it. Meanwhile, this is how some highlights from this countdown from 83 stack up against the top 10 from this week in 2022. I'm gonna warn you, it's not pretty. Make sure to share your memories of these songs. What do you think about the new top 10? What are your thoughts on today's mainstream uh, top 40 versus the 80s mainstream top 40? Share your thoughts on that. Let's have a good discussion below. Uh, If we didn't get to your dedication or your memory, we will share with us in the comments. If you like our content, we do invite you to subscribe below. Keep the music alive. That's what we do here. Check out our Patreon. Check out our merch. All of this is about keeping this a daily channel and keeping this music going. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. (laughs) 